Welcome to Story Quest. Today, I will be reading Little Woman, Chapter 28, Part 1. Like most other matrons, Meg began her married life with a determination to be a model housekeeper. John should find home a paradise. He should always see a smiling face, should fare sumptuously every day, and never know the loss of a button. She brought so much love, energy, and cheerfulness to the work that she could not but succeed in spite of some obstacles. Her paradise was not a tranquil one, for the little woman fussed, was over-anxious to please, and bustled about like a true Martha. Cumbered with many cares, she was too tired, sometimes even to smile. John grew dyspeptic after a course of dainty dishes and ungrateful demanded plain fare. As for buttons, she soon learned to wonder where they went to shake her head over the carelessness of men and to threaten to make him sew them on himself and see if his work would stand impatient and clumsy fingers any better than hers. They were very happy even after they discovered that they couldn't live on love alone. John did not find Meg's beauty diminished. Though she beamed at him from behind the familiar coffee pot, nor did Meg miss any of the romance from the daily parting. When her husband followed up his kiss with a tender inquiry, shall I send some veal or mutton for dinner, darling? The little house ceased to be glorified power. But it became a home, and the young couple soon felt that it was a change for the better. At first, they played keep house and frolicked over it like children. Then John took steadily to business, filling the cares of the head of a family upon his shoulders. And Meg lay by her cambric wrappers, put on a big apron, and fell to work, as before said, with more energy and discretion. While the cooking mania lasted, she went through Mrs. Cornelia's recipe book as if it was a mathematical exercise, working out the problem with patience and care. Sometimes her family were invited in to help eat up a too bounteous feast of success, or Lottie would be privately dispatched with a batch of failures which were to be concealed from all eyes in the convenient stomachs of the little hummels. An evening with John over the count books usually produced a temporary lull in the culinary euthanism, and a frugal fit would ensue, during which the poor man would put through a course of bread pudding, ash, and warmed over calf coffee, which tried his soul. Although he bore it with praiseworthy fortitude before the golden mean was found. However, Meg added to her domestic possessions what young couples seldom get along without a family jar. Fired with a housewifely wish to see her storeroom stocked with homemade preserves, she undertook to put up her own currant jelly. John was requested to order home a dozen or so of little pots with extra quantity of sugar where their own currants were ripe and were to be attended to at once as john firmly believed that my wife was equal to anything and took a natural pride in her skill he resolved that she should be gratified and their only crop of fruit laid by in a most pleasing form for winter use. Home came four dozen delightful little pots, half a barrel of sugar, and a small boy to pick up the currants for her. With her pretty hair tucked into a little cap, arms barred to the air elbow, and checked apron, which had a look in spite of a bib, the young housewife fell to work feeling no doubt about her success, for hadn't she seen Hannah do it a hundred of times. The array of pots 
rather amazed her at first. But John was so fond of jelly, and the nice little jars would look so well on the top shelf that Meg herself to fill them all and spent a long day picking, boiling, straining, and fussing over her jelly. She did her best as she asked the advice of Mrs. Cornelius. She racked her brain to remember what Hannah did that left she left out done. She reboiled, resugared, restrained, but the dreadful stuff wouldn't gel. She longed to run home, bib and all, and ask mother to lend her a hand. But John and she had agreed that they would never annoy anyone with their private worries, experiments, or quarrels. They had laughed over the last word of it. The idea it suggested was a more preposterous one, but they had held to the resolve that whenever they could get on without help, they did so. And no one interfered, for Mrs. March had devised the plan, so Meg wrestled alone with the refractory sweetmeats all that hot summer day, and at five o'clock sat down in her topsy-turvy kitchen, wrung her hands, lifted up her voice, and wept. Now, in the first flush of the new life, she had often said, My husband shall always feel free to bring a friend home whenever he likes and I shall always be prepared. There shall be no flurry, no scolding, no discomfort, but a neat house and a cheerful wife, and a good dinner. John, dear, never stop to ask my leave. Invite whom you please, and be sure of a welcome for me. How charming that was, to be sure. John quite glowed with pride to hear her say it, and felt what a blessed thing it was to have a superior wife. But although he they had company from time to time, and never happened to be unexpected, and Meg had never had the opportunity to distinguish herself till now. It always happened so in this veil of tears, such things which we can only wonder at, deplore, and bear as best we can. If John had not forgotten all about the jelly, it really would have been unpardonable in him to choose that day, of all the days in the year, to bring a friend home to dinner unexpectedly, congratulating himself that a handsome repast had been ordered that morning, feeling sure that it would be ready to the minute, and indulging in pleasant anticipations of the charming effect it would produce, when his pretty rook came running out to meet him. He escorted his friend to his mansion with an irrepressible satisfaction of a young host and husband. It is a world of disappointments, as John discovered. When he reached the dovecote, the front door usually stood hospitably open. Now it was not only shut, but locked, and yesterday's mud still adorned the steps. The parlor windows were closed, a curtain, and a picture of the pretty wife sewing on the piazza in white with a distracting little bow in her hair, or a bright-eyed hostess smiling a shy welcome as she greeted her guest. Nothing of the sort, for not a soul appeared but a looking boy asleep under the currant bushes. I'm afraid something happened. Stepped into the garden, Scott, while I look up Mrs. Brooke, said John, alarmed at the silence and solitude. Round the house, he hurried, led by a pungent smell of burnt sugar, and Mr. Scott strolled after him. With a weird look on his face, he paused discreetly at a distance when Brooke appeared, but he could both see and hear, and being a bachelor, enjoy the prospect mightily. In the kitchen reigned confusion and despair, one addition of jelly, which trickled from pot to pot, Another lay upon the floor, and a third was burning happily on the stove. Lottie, with Teutonic phlegm, was calmly eating bread and currant wine, for the jelly was still in a hopeless liquid state while Mrs. Brooke, with her apron overhead, sat sobbing dismally. My dearest girl, what is the matter? cried John, rushing in 
with awful visions of scalding hands, sudden news of affliction, a secret consternation at the thought of the guest in the house. Oh, John, I'm so tired and hot and cross and worried. I've been at it till I'm all worn out. Do come and help me, or I shall die. And the exhausted housewife casts herself upon his breast, giving him a sweet welcome in every sense of the word, for her pinafore had been baptized at the same time as the floor. What worries you, dear? Has anything dreadful happened? asked the anxious John, tenderly kissing the crown of the little cap, which was all askew. Yes, sobbed Meg despairingly. Tell me quick then, don't cry. I can bear anything better than that. Out with it, love. The jelly won't gel, and I don't know what to do. John Brooke laughed, then he never dared to laugh afterward. And the derisive Scott smiled involuntarily as he heard the hearty plea, which put the finishing stroke to poor Meg's woe. Is that all? Fling it out the window. No, don't bother any more about it. I'll buy you quartz if you want it. But for heaven's sake, don't have hysterics. For I brought Jack Scott home to dinner, and John got no further. For Meg cast him off and clasped her hands with tragic gesture as she fell into a chair, exclaiming in a tone of mingled indignation, reproach, and dismay. A man to dinner, and everything is a mess. John Brooke, how could you do such a thing? Hush, he's in the garden. I forgot to go found the jelly, but it can't be helped now, said John, surveying the prospect with an anxious eye. You ought to have sent word, or told me this morning, and you ought to have remembered how busy I was. Continue Meg potentially, for even turtle doves will peck when ruffled. I didn't know this morning, and there was no time to send word, for I met him on the way out. I never thought of asking leave, when you have always told me to do as I liked. I never tried it before, and hang me if I ever do it again, added John with aggravated air. I should hope not. Take him away at once. I can't see him, and there isn't any dinner. Well, I like that. Where's the beef and vegetables I sent home? And I put in you promise, cried John, rushing to the larder. I hadn't time to cook anything. I meant to dine at Mother's. I'm sorry, but I'm so busy. And Meg's tears began again. John was a mild man. But he was human, and after a long day's work, to come home tired, hungry, and hopeful, to find a chaotic house, an empty table, and a cross wife was not exactly conductive to repose of mind or manner. He restrained himself, however, and the little squall would have blown over, but for one unlucky word. It's a scrap, I acknowledge, but if you will lend a hand, we'll pull through and have a good time yet. Don't cry, dear. But just exert yourself a bit and fix us up something to eat. We're both hungry as hunters, and we shan't mind what it is. Give us the cold meat and bread and cheese, and we won't ask for jelly. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and comment down below. And if you have not done so already, Please subscribe and hit that bell notification for future videos. And please check out my second channel and podcast when you have the time called Viva Quest. The links are in the description box below. Thank you.